So, the quick path for today is I want to show you a bunch of things. We're going to talk about why we do this. I'm also going to make sure that you understand why you want to think about it, when you want to think about it. This is not something that you need to think about today unless you're trying to gain a leg up on some competitor and you're in a tight environment. These are one of these new technologies that will allow you to do things you can't quite do with the technologies we currently have with Kubernetes on just basic container technology and Kubernetes technology. So it's important to think about your own situation when you're evaluating this, this, uh, the work that we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is WebAssembly, the system interface, and the WebAssembly component model. I've mentioned those briefly. I will give you a quick overview of what they are. We're going to also talk about the movement of compute. Um, That'll become self-evident self when we get there. We're going to talk about why Kubernetes is the JavaScript of orchestrators, and that's annoying, but it is actually a great thing, because it turns out JavaScript is incredible language, even though I don't like it. Um, fundamental protection, we're going to talk about security, right? And then we're going to figure out where you could go with this, what you can do. And we'll also talk about timelines. Now, I'm one of those people, because I'm talking about something new, Right? Not a new feature, but the ability to do things you can't do with just a feature. This is Kubernetes, what we're doing. Everything I'm going to show you is open source. Everything. It all is either in a foundation or a specification in the W3C, or in the Container D project in the CNCF, or in OCI. It is all just Kubernetes, even though what we've done is something very strange from the perspective of containers, we've decided that there are other abstract processes that Kubernetes can schedule. So it can schedule containers, and it can schedule WebAssembly modules outside of the browser. So let's start. First of all, we've got to figure out what WebAssembly really is. How many people think they know what WebAssembly is? Just a quick raise of hands. Come on, you're enthusiastic after lunch. There are six people here who think they know what that is, and I like that. WebAssembly is a virtual stack specification for a virtual VM. It's a stack-based machine, but it's abstract. Okay? And it, if you've heard about it, WebAssembly, you've heard about it with related, related to the web and, web, and in fact, browsers. So the name web, right? Obviously, okay, if you know about this, you know about browsers. Now, what can you do with that? It's actually an implementation a, specify, a specification in the W3C for what was originally the JavaScript bytecode. So if you think about JavaScript in the browser, right, it gets interpreted or AOT'd or whatever it might be, it gets compiled down into a bytecode. That bytecode then can be mapped to actual native code extremely efficiently. So the JavaScript part might be slow, but the bytecode to assembly, to machine, is extremely efficient. And that allowed people to do really cool things because instead of compiling, dropping JavaScript in the browser, what they could do is they could take old C code and compile C out to the bytecode target and then run the bytecode target in the browser. So if you have seen Adobe's Photoshop in the browser, that little you know, kind of thing, they, they do that now. That's WebAssembly in the browser. If you have seen Google Earth in the browser, and done the Google Earth thing. That is Google Earth C code in the browser. And it's all over the place already, including inside Kubernetes. So for example, uh, if you take it out of the browser, because it was, it was born in the browser, it is one of the most attacked surfaces on the planet. And so the sandbox is mathematically provable for WebAssembly. So that's a critical thing to know. The module is by default secure. Now, when we talk about containers, quick side, sidebar, how many people realize that by default, the containers are actually using the same kernel every other process on the machine is, right? You do get that, right? Good. If you don't get that, it's a fundamental cat category of understanding in Kubernetes and containers because most of the work of the Kubernetes distributions is to help protect you against that problem, right? Because if you know a zero day in the kind of neutral sense, you can actually own the kernel. And if you own the kernel, you know, own all the other containers and all the other processes. And that's typically bad. Okay? WebAssembly does the reverse. Because it started in the browser, it was designed to prevent the module from being able to do anything outside the sandbox at all, unless the host explicitly permitted it. Now, 
How many people would love it if containers had that model and not the by default acceptable model? <laughs> like that is what you really want. Okay? Second thing that's cool about WebAssembly is that it's not an environment. There's no operating system inside WebAssembly. Think about a native experience when you're compiling code, C, Rust, JavaScript, whatever you're doing. Eventually, it's just the code that needs to execute in that binary, right? But a container is an entire operating system. And it doesn't even matter if you like shrink it down, it's a very you know, alpine or something. Like it doesn't matter if it's a small operating system, it's fundamentally an application needs an operating system. It expects libc, it expects the Win32 SDK, it expects a file system and all that good stuff that, that our code is already using, right? WebAssembly is not that. It's much more like a cloud native binary. It is only the operational code path that you have implemented. So this means that web assemblies are extremely small, relatively speaking, right? On the order of very small. Uh, a year ago, we ported. Um, Francisco is in the back. He, I'm going to make him. I'm going to point him out. That's Francisco. Wave, Francisco. Okay. I'm going to call on Francisco later because I'm going to show you a demo of some of his stuff. Okay. Francisco's team last year ported a bit. Uh, they have an open source project called Acre which allows the, a Kubernetes cluster to operate against uh, device telemetry, device protocols, things like cameras, sensors, and so on. Okay, they, poured, they had a 12 megabyte container, which they thought was really good for the controller for Acre. When they ported that to WebAssembly, it was 174 KB. Now, that's really cool. I'm gonna show you even more reduction in size. Now, it's nice to talk about reduction in size. It doesn't come free. You've got to work at it, just like anything. There's nothing free in life. But there are things you can lean into. So the critical thing with the WebAssembly size is that you have to realize that now you're, if it's, it's, it's operating system and architecture agnostic, now you can actually only have one module instead of building a matrices. Right, a matrix of modules for one for Windows, one for Linux, one for ARM, even if you're just Linux, you know, this kind of stuff. Okay? You don't have to do that with WebAssembly. Why? Because every browser had to, originally, when the specification was being written, had to learn how to run a browser on a, on a Mac phone, right? An Apple phone, or on Android, or on Linux, or on all kinds of things. Unixes have browsers and, and, and like all kinds of weird chips that like I remember from when I was a kid. I'm sure Solaris has browsers, for example, right? BSDs, all that stuff, it just runs because it's a virtual machine and the implementation is underneath, right? A runtime, just like the JVM or .NET, except for it is truly meant to be democratic, completely open source. There are 20 or so WebAssembly runtimes, two of which we use in the Bytecode Alliance. Those are the ones that I'm gonna show you here today. So there are two other aspects of WebAssembly that I wanna get through. One is the system interface and one is the component model. How many people remember the COM component model? Common, uh, component? I feel so sorry for you people because I'm one of them. Everybody else, you people just feel satisfied. Just like you just cruise on by. So, um, the interesting thing about the system interface is really easily to say. You can think of it like a cloud-native syslib or Win32. It's something you can compile a program to. It is functionally like the bytecode uh, layer. So your Rust can compile to it, JavaScript can compile to it, whatever it is. Okay? .NET can compile to it. I'll show you that. Okay? That's great. That's great stuff. Because now every runtime, if it implements the system interface, the WebAssembly system interface, also called WASI, now every module can be run by different runtimes. That's the specification that allows you to build a module that can be run anywhere. And the interesting thing is some runtimes can be run in extremely unique places. Like there are bare metal CPUs where the operating system is a WASI kernel and you actually just give it a module and you run bare metal on a chip, not on a machine, a chip. So it's really useful stuff, this kind of portability. It's all based on the component model, which is a specification for how those interfaces in the syslib are written. So really the system interface and the component model go, to, go together. 
But the interesting thing about this, this is the last sweet technical detail, and we'll get into the fun stuff, right? The interesting thing about this is, I can now compile a kernel. Let's say I wanted to build uh, some sort of uh, UDF, a user-defined function that sits right on top of a database. But I want you, for example, to give me your code, your third-party code, but I can see you were untrustworthy. So I know I'm worried about it, right? So we want a boundary. So we like WebAssembly. By default, you can't do anything, even if you put log4j in there for fun, okay? And by the way, log4j will not work in WebAssembly by default. You, you have to let it break your system. It won't work. So you do that. I don't trust you. I run WebAssembly, okay? And that allows me to go ahead and sit, but I can compile the service so that it actually doesn't have the part of the syslib that does file access. Maybe you're just doing a query compilation on a sitting on top of a database. You don't need file access. I can remove network I.O. You don't need network I.O. You're trying to get, you know, build some huge query, right? So I can actually have control over the kernel. You could think of it as a cloud-native uh, unikernel format in some sense as well, okay? All based on components. If the component that you're building matches the runtime host's component supported list, it will run. And not just at one place, but everywhere. So you can build systemic interfaces for hosts, and you can have democratic interfaces and implementations on, on the part of a module. Could be any language you want, as long as it compiles to the component model. More or less makes sense? Okay, this stuff can still run in a browser, it can still run everywhere else, but it has these characteristics that are super useful. Small, tight, secure, everything is great. In addition to the fact that I can start one of these modules from cold in about six, no, I won't say that. I have seen it done in under, in, in high hundreds of nanoseconds. So how many people like the cold start capability of containers? Okay, you people are lying, unless you really use VMs a lot. In which case, yes, I understand completely, right? It's relative, okay? How many people love the cold start capabilities of Lambda or Azure Functions or something like that? Everybody's gonna raise their hand, right? You, we gotta have a conversation. Like, no, right? It's fine, again, compared to VMs and stuff like this, but it's not really great cold start. It has to warm up. And then it's really fast, right? Over time, it's really fast. WebAssembly individual modules can be started in under nanoseconds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you even cooler stuff. Okay, we're also gonna talk about why compute is moving outward, right? So we're all here talking about AKS. Now, a few things George mentioned to you, things like the fleet stuff that he mentioned, the connected clusters, that is there for a reason. The reason is, there's a couple of reasons why compute is beginning to move outward. One, because we understand a data center now, compute. Hyperscale, Azure is fantastic, it's great, we love it, blah, blah, blah. It is complex, it's hard to do, but it makes good money for everybody because it works. And we're making it better and easier and more secure all the time. Okay, but then we look outside the data center, outside the hyperscale stuff. And what do you have on CDN? You have CDN compute and every service has a different model. You can't take your stuff from Fastly and put it on Cloudflare, right? What happened to cloud native? Is it just that I get to just do the one thing on Cloudflare forever and I never get to leave? Cloudflare likes that. But do you really like that? That locks your business in. It might not be called proprietary, but in a sense, it's a lock anyway. And the, what you really want is the flexibility that containers give you, like Kubernetes gives you, right? You also want good partners to run it with, but that becomes a, 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 a transparent choice for you based on your ability to use open source technologies like Kubernetes and Kubernetes. You want that with your other stuff off the edge, but we don't have that. We have a bunch of proprietary solutions, native code. None of this is cloud native. We're talking about industrial verticals and transportation and um, there are going to be satellites with compute data centers on them not too long about. Every container ship in the world is its own little data center, right? And guess what? Unlike hyperscale, all those CPUs are different. They were purchased at different times. 
All those architectures are dipping. Boy, ARM is looking really good. Even in the, the hyperscale data center, it's looking really good and so forth. I believe George may have teased you a little bit about the ARM stuff earlier. So basically, the, what we're saying is there is no abstract cloud native workflow for this environment, but we have it in hyperscale. And what we really want is to actually take the lessons and the tools from hyperscale and begin to use them all over and get rid of the things that require some custom expert to lock you up in a contract forever just because you need to do something out there with weird chips. So WebAssembly actually gives us that ability. That's why you're thinking about this right now, or that's what my argument is that you should be. And that's certainly why, why uh, Microsoft is doing it. Um, Kubernetes is a great tool, right? But it's really the JavaScript of orchestrators. It's not that it doesn't work, it works everywhere. The real problem, you can see I didn't do the, lot, the bottom line. Just imagine that's not there because it should come sailing in later, but I didn't do it. The real problem is not Kubernetes. The real problem is the container model is so architecture and OS trapped, and it has a bad security model in the sense that you've got to go and clean it up underneath with the architecture, right, and the infrastructure. And it's also big, in addition to security stuff. It's big. A lot of people don't get time to, uh, to, to optimize their container images, even though we know we can get them down to small images. You just can't do it. It's hard. You don't have time to do it. So what we've done, Microsoft created an integration. We've been working on an integration with Kubernetes because customers ask us to make Kubernetes do more. It's not just have it be available in more places. They actually want us to have it do more things that Kubernetes and containers can't really do. But Kubernetes can do it if it isn't paying attention to containers. So what we've done is we build a containerd shim that's called RunWazi. So if you go up to github.com slash container D slash run that is a shim we have built that has two runtimes in it, and you can use it to create and attach WebAssembly applications to Kubernetes. Purely open source, part of the container D CNCF project, but it is actually the infrastructure for AKS WASI node pool. And so all the stuff we're going to talk about here, right, is that shim. It can run anywhere. And you know, other people have proved it. Fermion, which is a startup, they, we collaborated with them and built a, 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 what they call a spin. They have a function model called spin. We built a spin shim with them. That's in AKS. You want to use spin? Use spin. You want to use slight, which is our uh, runtime, right? You can use that for functions. But tomorrow, I can't de de demo it today because I just built it this morning and couldn't wire it up in time. But tomorrow at the Microsoft Theater in the morning uh, at 11, I think it is, uh, I'm going to show you a, Wasm, a, Was, a VMware Wasm Worker shim running an AKS. Who would ever thought we were going to be doing that? But that's the open source flexibility we have right now. I don't, we don't care. You don't care whether you're using the Wasm, Word, Wasm uh, the VMware uh, function. It does Ruby in WebAssembly. You want to use Ruby, so use it. You can do it in AKS. That's what, that's what Containerd does. And you can see that we have slight spin. I mentioned the VMware thing. Anybody heard the, about Docker desktop Wasm uh, technical preview? Probably only a couple people because you're here for Kubernetes. But Docker desktop now supports this same shim. So you can actually test it locally, run it, push it to Docker Hub or ACR, whatever you want, and then run it in AKS. It works, right? Go just, compile, just announced their merge to compile to Wasi Preview. Um, and so you can take your Go code and compile it to WebAssembly components and get it to run. Know what that means? That means we can take the service mesh sidecars that everybody loves so much. I'm dragging that out because somebody's got to get mad at me. right? Those sidecars are usually Go. They can be compiled to WebAssembly components and you can run them in proc rather than, and that would eliminate two gRPC calls in every pod you have. That's cool. That's going to be an immediate performance improvement over what we have now. As I said, AKS Wazi Opos runs, runs Wazi shims. 
The AKS Edge experience, that's Francisco. It's the AKS, it runs the same infrastructure. Any Kubernetes system that runs this infrastructure, you can use exactly the same way. And because it's a container D shim, there is a documented way to get it installed. So it's very easy to do either in an Azure distribution or in any distribution you want. And finally, I'm not sure if you know, but there are public and private what they call multi-edge compute services, MEC. This is one of Microsoft's finest naming moments. Um, MEC services uh, do have, they have things like VMs and AKS and things like that. And you can use this there too, not just AKS in the hyperscale. So what does this look like? Let's get you, get you something that uh, is kind of interesting. I'm going to jump over here to a couple of videos. And this one is very similar to something that, that, um, uh, that George mentioned or showed earlier. And then let's see here. If we, where is the actual play button? It's kind of vanished. There it is. Okay. So here we are in AKS. This is very similar, but you can see we've added two WASI node pools. And this one is AMD64 Linux, right? And the other one, WASI pool 2, is ARM. So two different price values, right? Two different price points, two different architectures. But the operating system is the same. And we deploy the Azure Hello World thing. And the containers, which are only built for Linux AMD, accidentally get scheduled to the ARM nodes. Accidentally. And now it's a mess. They blow up. They're very common, right? You can see the ARM right there. But if we go over to look at a WASM workload, right? Five replicas of a WASM workload. This is a web assembly using, uh, I believe, Slight and Spin. Yes, both Fermion and the Microsoft one. And you can see that over on the right-hand side, from your right, they all get scheduled randomly, either to ARM or AMD, and they just run. So I want you to notice something. They have, before we continue, I'm going to stop that for a second. Stop. Okay, before we continue, they have just randomly ignored architecture. That means, not that it's cool, that means you running WebAssembly workloads can now deliberately choose to pay, what is the cost price differential? Anybody know between ARM and AMD? It's something. You can now choose or begin to choose a price differential that really matters to you, and you haven't changed your workload. You can still run containers in the cluster, but you can have ARM for other things, even without doing the, cl the cluster maintenance, right? So if I keep going, I'm going to prove that this is true by going to the node pools, right? And I'm going to go find that AMD node pool, right here, and I'm going to destroy it. And of course, you know what's going to happen, but seeing it is really cool. Now, I didn't speed this up or anything. Wait for the moment of termination. Right there. And now we're all running again. Look at the node pools. You've just done a full migration from AMD to ARM with those workloads, and you did nothing. And Kubernetes just said, yeah, fine, over there. So even without knowing what WebAssembly does, or even without knowing anything detailed about WebAssembly, you've just seen something that makes your world easier. You can now forget about that. Now, George showed that the other day, uh, earlier. Did not something like that, did he not? Somebody tell me, yes, he did. Yes, he did. Thank you. I will pay you later. So today I want to show you, we've been working upstream, right? So I'm going to play you a very similar demonstration that it looks a lot like this. Same AKS, okay? We just completed this Friday. You can see, or actually Thursday, James did it. And he says, hey, look, we've got a Windows AMD node, right? Okay, cool. We've got a Linux AMD node. Okay, cool. And we've got a couple Linux ARM64 nodes, the gold, old trusted and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we're going to go over here, and we're going to do the same thing. 
We're going to sit there and say, okay, let's try the Azure vote. Right? And it's created and we got a lot more things. And look what happens. Two of them arbitrarily get scheduled on AMD Linux and they work. Three do not. Right? And the reason is because they get scheduled to the wrong type of architecture or operating system. Same thing. So if we take a WebAssembly runtime, same kind of idea. This is actually the same test runtime for the shim. And we go ahead and spin five of those in there. Okay. They go ahead and create. They're running. Now look at the distribution. And I'll let him highlight it first. Okay. Look at the distribution on node types. Just random. There are no node selectors here. There are no taints, no tolerations. The YAML is an OCI reference. The image is an OCI reference. It is in uh, GHCR, right? Could be in Docker Hub, could be in ACR, anything. That is pure node agnosticity. The way we really would love to have containers work, but do not. And if we continue, you, can know, you now know what I'm going to do to finish out this version of no dancing. So I'm going to go ahead and just destroy everything, slowly but surely. And now the idea that you have a Windows machine. Say some of you have a big Windows workload. And you're thinking this is really cool. But you're worried that you have to actually start using Linux or something like that. Or even that you need more Windows workloads for this. No, you can run them with your containers that you're already running. Because they don't care, right? Look at the migration that's already happened. We got rid of one of the node pools, and then we got rid of the other node pool, and now we're just running on Windows. We never changed anything. And the containers, of course, are still broken. You still now have to go back and rebuild them, either for architecture or for operating system. These nodes are completely opaque to you from a workload standpoint, and they go anywhere. Not only do they go anywhere, and I can show you the rest of the demo, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go ahead and pop out because there's one more I want to show you. And this is what we did on AKS Edge Edition. So this is Francisco. Francisco, raise your hand again. Okay, and the reason I'm trying to torture him because I like him, so that's why I'm doing that. Francisco just built this application using WebAssembly and Ocri using the AKS EE. Uh, Edge Edition, Edge Experience, uh, another Microsoft naming gem. That distribution is the same shim. So the same stuff will run there anywhere. And this could be on ARM, could be on anything else. Right? So if we go ahead and click this and let this roll, you will now see. The demo that he built using Ocri and a WebAssembly that is about, what was it, 2.7 megabytes in the end? Something like that. More? Yeah, that's about three, under three megabytes. And so he goes ahead and enables it, right, with a little script that he's got, right? And in the future, you can imagine this will be even more streamlined and easy, just like it is in AKS. Right? And now he goes, you can look and see what's going on. He's jumping in there and looking at the shims. And you can see there's a slight shim. So he's actually going to create a couple applications, a spin app, a slight app, both web assemblies, but different app models, different companies, different projects. And you can see he's got it up and running. Okay, fine. But what is it? It's actually he's doing inferencing on the edge. Very simple but critical app. About 60%. You know, I mean, just a guess. Not a big, most of this is just basic frame rate. This is a, how many nodes did you have? Just one? Just one. This is a K3D's distribution running an AKS supported system, right? Using the same thing you can use in AKS. It is the same. Is this on the edge in AKS? Is it connected through the fleet management? Yes, it can be. This system, this, the, the story we're trying to build here is something we need as well as anybody else. We need to be able to move our stuff around. We need to be able to do the work we need to do anytime we need to do it. All right, I'm going to show one more demo to give you even more of an idea. Uh, no, I'm not. 
Oh, that's disappointing. Oh, no, no, I have it. Yay. Okay. This is a presentation I gave at Docker, at a Docker thing a little while back. But I'm going to jump ahead because there is a demo here I wish to show you, and then I will end. Right? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's the Rainer Stropic thing. That's Kubernetes and Fermion Cloud. There we go. This is the last demo. And this is AKS. It was built by our GBB team. A couple of GBBs back in the corner, Kevin and Gustav. They are amazing. Participated in the construction of this application. This is a, uh, no, this is the end of the application of the previous demo. Here's the K K3D's cluster. Okay, it is a small cluster. It is a full application with a bunch of services. It generates orders, prints receipts, does a little SKU, you know, little QR code kind of thing. And this is running in Azure uh, against Azure services. This is, Azure, this is service bus, so it's going ahead and queuing some messages, reads off the whole thing. And that is regular operation of the demo. And it does some blobs because it's going to print out QR codes and receipts and invoices. So we're going to go look at the blobs and you can see that we're doing a bunch of blob work. Great, fantastic, regular Kubernetes application. But what we want to show you is that we can actually torch one of those services. The receipt, uh, we got to type it right. The receipt generation service we're going to get rid of, which was written in .NET, right? We're going to replace it with a WebAssembly receipt generation service. And it's in the same cluster. It's on the same node. The node doesn't care, right? So it's going to go ahead and create it. We've got a container creating, and it's running fantastically. And so we go back and we show you that we're running the same application. This is not terribly flashy, right? It's just good software apps. That's it. It's just a basic app that does its stuff. What I want to show you is that if we go and look at Awkward Industries, right? Look at the size of that thing. That's the same exact service. That Awkward's industry service, that same exact service is just over two megabytes, just under three. Now let's look at the other service that was originally there, 210 megabytes. Now it's not apples to or, uh, apples. We jumped languages here from .NET to Rust. And everybody should immediately go, well, okay, right? Let me show you something amazing. This is what's coming. I didn't have this gunned up before, but I should. Uh, Steve Sanderson, um, net isolator. This is experimental work that Steve Sanderson is doing related to running WebAssembly. Steve Sanderson is one of the lead engineers on Blazor. Right? So something we already do that runs WebAssembly. Oh, I got to get rid of this. Reject all. You bet I do. Okay. So we're going to go over here to the end. Oh, I'm probably going to have to click through an ad. Yes. Pigment flecken. Thank you. You're buying me a beer after this. Okay, so this is Steve, and he's going to talk a lot about a lot of things, but here's what I really want to get to. When he gets to the end, he's going to time this. He's going to, what? <laughs> oh, Steve. Huh? Yeah, no question. So he's actually doing this isolated runtime. Look into .NET Isolator Library if you want. He's building his own WASM runtime, and he's baselining it with 7.5 milliseconds to create an entire ASP.NET application. 7.5 milliseconds. But then what he does is he grabs that isolated runtime out, and he says, you know what? Let's reuse the same isolated runtime and just put a new application in it. And then we'll baseline that. So he's invoking the get hello. It's just a hello app, so no big deal there. Now watch the time. Okay. Same, same thing. He's creating an isolated. That's a full app, but 9.8 seconds. Now he's going to do what I just described too early. He's going to take the uh, runtime host out, and you reuse the same isolated runtime host. Now watch the time. 
Now, I'm going to stop there. You can't do that with containers. You can't do that with containers in hyperscale unless you buy a lot of VMs. That's the difference we're leaning into here. These features are amazing. They're built into AKS right now. They're built into AKS EE right now. You may not use them unless you're in a desperate competitive situation, but you should be investigating them because they are the cloud native binary. And Microsoft is building it into its services so that you can seamlessly begin to use them as you see new opportunities. That's what WebAssembly and AKS are doing. I think I have like 30 seconds for a question, <laughs> but I'll be available uh, in the back or outside. Thank you very much.